Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Cooper, our moderator for the next panel. Um, just a little bit about Dr. Cooper. She currently serves as Director of International Politics and Economics at SMU's John Goodwin Tower Center for Political Studies. Uh, Dr. Cooper has served in a number of posts um, during her career. Some of these include Undersecretary for the Economics for, for Economic Affairs at the U.S. Commerce Department, Chief Economist for ExxonMobil, and uh, Dean of the College of Business at North Texas University. Um, in addition to her role at SMU, she also currently serves um, in a number of uh, chair positions and other roles, including chair of the National Bureau of Economic Research. Um, she serves as director to the Williams Companies and Deutsche Bank Trust Company of America of the Americas, and is a member of the. Uh, what is that? Can't read my own handwriting. <laughs> of the Council of Foreign Relations, she received her PhD in economics from the University of Colorado and masters, and her BA and or her masters in economics from the University of Texas and a BA in Mathematics from the University of Texas. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Kathleen Cooper. Thank you very, very much um, for that kind introduction. I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. Let me welcome you again. You've been welcomed a few times today, no doubt, uh, to this the continuation of this day-long, very, very interesting conference on energy matters. Uh, and we also learned, for those of you like me who did not know, that it's all for a very good cause. I appreciated hearing that from Jason over lunch. So the title of this session is rather broad, uh, Texas Window on Foreign Investment, Geopolitics, and National Energy Security. Obviously, uh, three interrelated topics, very important topics uh, in, in, a, in the world today, given how uncertain the world is today. And I think the title gives us a broad mandate to talk about a number of things. And I think that's appropriate. What we're going to do is each of the panelists I'm going to introduce, as you've seen earlier in the day, I'll introduce each of them and get them started talking about some area, an area of their expertise. Each will focus mainly on one of these areas, but they may end up uh, intertwined a little bit more. Uh, we have, and we have for this discussion, this somewhat more ethereal discussion, perhaps, than some of the other more practical and, and good things we've heard today. Uh, we have, uh, you know, three good people, very excellent people uh, with different points of view. They have quite different backgrounds. We have an economist, an accountant, and an engineer. Now that has the makings of a very good joke, but I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I think I know one, but I'm not going there. Uh, anyway, I think the fact that they come with very different backgrounds uh, will mean that their take on some of these issues uh, will be unique, and, and I certainly look forward to those insights. We um, I think you've been told that their full bios are on the website, uh, but I do want to hit the highlights for each of these folks, because you need to understand before they start talking with you a little bit about their background. I think that's always very helpful. Uh, we're going to start with Ken Medlock, who is sitting next to me. He is the James and Susan Baker Fellow in Energy and Resource Economics at Rice University's Baker Institute. He's a senior director of the Center for Energy Studies there and a lecturer in Rice's economics department. He's published uh, numerous scholarly articles and uh, done a lot of model simulations um, on areas of energy related areas of his prime interest which include natural gas markets energy commodity price relationships gasoline markets and and uh, nat national oil company behavior he holds a phd from rice he's actively involved in energy economics and general economics professional associations received a number of awards for his work and served as advisor to DOE, Department of Energy, as well as the California government. We're glad you're doing that. Hope you're helping out there and in our great state of California. He's very highly regarded for his work, and I'm sure you'll enjoy what he has to say um, to us. He's going to talk, I think, about energy security. You know, we all have a different definition of what energy security is, 
And perhaps you can start by telling us how you think of energy security and how you think it's going to evolve and affect the energy industry in, in this country over the next few years. Ken? Sure. Um, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, this is actually my first visit, uh, visit here, and it's actually a quite spectacular institution. Um, great facilities, uh, and this is a great place to have an, an event like this. Um, Energy security is a very broad topic, as Kathleen just basically said. Um, and she's right. To a lot of different people, it means a lot of different things. Um, generally, though, uh, you know, fortunately, I'll fall back on a very long and deep literature um, that is rooted in economics. Um, it's, it's, it's rooted in economics, but it really highlights the intersection of economics, politics, and in particular, where those two intersect around the energy business. Um, uh, but usually when we talk about energy security, and I'm going to give you kind of a mouthful of the definition and then kind of dive into it just briefly. Um, you're really talking about uh, uh, securing access to supplies so that you can avoid the macroeconomic dislocations, so upsets in the general business cycle, if you will, associated with energy disruptions or energy price spikes. So you think about that and you think, wow, that's a lot to really sort of internalize. But um, the reason this whole field sort of got going, if you will, in its modern form was because there was some work done back in the early 1980s that really tied together movements in the general business cycle and movements in, in oil prices, uh, and then more generally energy prices. But what's been true since World War II is that every single recession in the United States, except for one, has been preceded by a run-up in the price of energy. Now, correlation is not causation, but that's a pretty remarkable correlation. Um, and so it's triggered a lot of interest in the academic community about trying to understand, well, what are the potential channels for transmission between energy price movements and the availability of energy more generally in, in the macro economy? Um, you know, there's a famous saying, energy is the go of things, so it shouldn't be surprising that when energy prices go up, it gets a little bit more expensive for us to do what we normally do. <laughs> And so that will adversely affect our daily activities. But there is an interesting strand of this whole literature that I think ties back to the theme of the day, which is really what's been going on in North America and the United States more generally, um, which uh, looks at a particular channel of transmission from energy prices to the macro economy that involves the balance of payments. So what's the trade balance? Um, what has been actually shown in numerous studies uh, uh, is that if you're an oil importer, you typically tend to do worse when oil prices go up. If you're an oil exporter, you typically tend to do better when oil prices go up. Um, you know, Texas is kind of a microcosm of this because when the oil, oil prices is, are high, Texas economy does pretty well. Right? So in that sense, it's in a lot of ways counter cyclical to the rest of the country. But in general, when we talk about the overall U.S. economy, what we've seen is that you know, that balance of payments mechanism really tends to, 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 to act in, in spades, if you will. Uh, what it amounts to is that you see when oil prices are rising, a, 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 a transfer of wealth from an oil importer to an oil exporter. And so this gets at the question around, should we export natural gas? Should we export crude oil? Should we only export petroleum products? Um, and certainly nobody, I don't think, is really talking about if we do move to a, a genre where we're talking about exporting crude oil now, because certainly there have already been, already been movement on the gas front. But if we start exporting crude oil, that we'll be a net exporter of crude. I think some people have that, and I'll just say it, pie-in-the-sky notion, but you have to also remember the United States is a massive consuming market, and that's not going to change. So if we do actually move to, to a situation where we're exporting more light crudes and importing heavier crudes, that's effectively a swap, but it's actually a revenue-improving swap. And so when you think about the, what that means for the balance of payments, it's actually an improvement on our balance of trade, and it creates what we would sometimes refer to as a balance of payment shield against energy price fluctuations. We can't get away from the fact that the global oil market is a global market. So even if we say we're going to keep it at home, guess what? We're still going to be tied to petroleum product markets internationally because there are no restrictions on petroleum product exports. And in fact, what we've seen right now is growth in petroleum product exports to the tune of about 3.6 million barrels a day from this country. That means petroleum products, so the price at the pump, is determined by the, bar the, the barrel at the margin or the international price of petroleum products. And so if we can somehow benefit, if you will, uh, by allowing that balance of payment shield to expand, and this would include allowing for crude oil exports, then it actually creates an improvement in the energy security 
uh, uh, framework under which the, the United States operates. Good, good. Kick us off on a good on a good point. Very good. I'm sure we'll come come back to that uh, potential for crude exports. So our second speaker uh, this afternoon is John England. He is vice chairman and U.S. oil and gas leader for Deloitte across all of its functions, which include consulting, audit and enterprise risk services, tax and financial advisory services. Uh, in this role, uh, John helps oil and gas companies solve their most complex challenges while also overseeing the significant investment Deloitte is making in its oil and gas practice. Uh, he has led successful projects and client relationships at some of the largest energy companies over his 24-year career uh, at Deloitte, with Deloitte. He is a frequent speaker on energy industry issues and trends, as well as all aspects of energy trading and risk management. You name the energy group, uh, looking at the list of places where he's given speeches, and he's been there. So he is a very frequent speaker along these lines. He serves on various not-for-profit boards and holds a degree in accounting and is a CPA in the state of Texas. Uh, Deloitte released a study, I don't know that it was that recent, I think it was within the last year, called The Challenges of Renaissance, Managing an Unprecedented Wave of Oil and Gas Capital Projects. I was hoping that perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that or, or some other research that you're sure. involved in that Deloitte does an awful lot, uh, obviously, in this space. So. He knows about it. Sure. Thank thanks. you, John. Uh, well, thanks for the introduction, and, and also thanks, thanks for having me here today. Um, you'd think from that, that introduction that all, all I do is run around and give speeches <laughs> and write papers, when in, in fact, I, I feel like mostly what I do is talk to clients in this industry, so uh, I enjoy that part of the job, and, and that's certainly what I think hopefully informs the, the view that I'll, I'll give to you today. Um, I, I guess um, the, the, the paper you mentioned, The Challenge of Renaissance, was really something we wrote um, because you know you hear a lot about the North American energy renaissance, uh, and obviously I think there's a tremendous amount of, of good news to talk about in terms of what's happened here in North America. Um, you know, one thing that we really like to focus on is the level of investment that's flown into our industry over the last few years. Um, not only the, the level of that, but where that's coming from. Um, so you know, for, for instance, the EMP capital uh, investment has gone up 46 percent. Uh, I guess just since you know, over the, the five-year period from 2009 to 2013, and really right behind that, we're seeing you know massive increases in terms of uh, midstream expenditures. Really, as the midstream sector tries to catch up, um, and now that's really moving farther downstream into refining into petrochemical, and and we can talk about some of that that more. Um, so, so there's a, you know I think a tremendous amount of, of good news in terms of what's happening in the industry. We hear a lot about that, particularly in Texas, we hear a lot about that uh, as we've heard from some of the other speakers. I'm not sure that that message is getting out perhaps as broadly across the country as we'd like, and I think that's part of the, part of the challenge we face. But we, we do think that there's a, a whole series of challenges that really are in front of us as we get to this next phase. Um, as I kind of talk to people and talk about you know, what our outlook for 2014 is, and we think 2014 is where we kind of turn into the harvest phase uh, of this, where this is less about going out and grabbing acreage and, 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 and drilling as it is in much really moving to the development side of the things, um, thinking about um, how are we going to get hydrocarbons to market in a way that's economic, um, in terms of looking at the large capital projects that it'll take to do that. So, you know, frankly, we think one of the biggest challenges is around capital projects and around cost in this industry. Um, and we're seeing a renewed focus, certainly, from, from all of our clients in terms of really looking at the cost. Um, whether that's the cost of development, whether that's the cost of, of um, transportation, or whether it's cost of processing in terms of building LNG facilities um, and, and the like. So, you know, I think that that's the theme that we really see coming through more than anything today is, is, a, is an enhanced focus on that. Um, and maybe I'll just explain a little bit on one aspect of that, which is around major capital projects. So, so the, the size of capital projects in our industry has never been higher um, and maybe that's obvious, everything goes up over time, but, but the, 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 the fact that we find perhaps more compelling is that the, the percentage, the size as a percentage of, of the balance sheets and of the market caps of the com companies in this industry has never been higher. So, so really the, the true risk level to these companies is huge. If you want to put it in simple terms, they're making huge bets on, on sometimes very small, you know, individual projects. And so that really heightens the importance of execution in that area. 
Um, it's an area we're seeing a lot more attention focused to. It's an area we think that would benefit from innovation, that we think that, that the same way we've been doing, for instance, large capital projects in this industry for 20, 30 years may, may not be the, the right way going forward. And there, there's innovation, we think, that's necessary in that space. So um, we're spending a lot of time with companies looking at that. You know, I think the other big challenge is some of which we can, we can talk about more. Some you've probably heard, you know, in other speakers today, certainly the talent issue is, is number one in, in the minds of probably most executives I, I speak to in terms of really thinking about what are our strategies for the future, um, in terms of really trying to apply uh, enhanced analytics to that process to, to think about, you know, wh where exactly is my talent issue five years, ten years down the road, and how do I best address that? Um, so, so I think, you know, it's, talent, it's, it's capital projects, it's cost, it's talent, um, and then the public perception issue, which uh, some others have mentioned, but um, I'll, I'll continue to beat that drum every time I can. Um, I'm, I'm proud when I tell people that I work in the oil and gas industry, um, and in Texas I get a pretty good reaction to that. I, I don't get such a good reaction when I go to other parts of the country and other parts of the world, and, and that bothers me. And so I, I think uh, we, we've still got a lot of work to do in terms of education about all the great things that our industry does. Amen. And I think we'll come back to that and probably come back to what you mentioned about the large projects because I understand the whole issue of mega projects was actually something they honed in on at Davos this year, so over and over again. Uh, but our, our next speaker, our third panelist, is Steve Patterson. He is, <clears throat> he is Managing Director at Moyes & Company, a firm that provides professional advisory services related to energy transactions for small and medium-sized companies. He has over 30 years of industry experience and has been developed directly involved, <clears throat> excuse me, with the evaluation over, of over $30 billion of exploration, development, and producing opportunities in 20 plus countries. You've been running around like a lot too, Dee. Yes. Um, prior to joining Moyes in 2000, Dee held reservoir and operations engineering and finance and control positions at Arco and Vastar Resources. Uh, since joining Moyes, I think he's been focused more on um, and become a real expert in global LNG activity and stranded gas. Uh, Dee Patterson has a mechanical engineering degree, so he's the engineer down at the other end there, uh, and an MBA in corporate finance. He's also a professional engineer involved in the societies, and this man even holds patents in the area of LNG uh, regas technology, and he's published papers and given speeches on gas to liquids. So he is a man in the trenches talking about uh, these issues and uh, being involved in the deals that are underway these days. So look forward to hearing from you on the state of the deals that you're seeing these days and what you see as challenges, wherever you want to take that. All right, absolutely. Um, even though we're, we're based in Dallas, we are pretty much a global practice of the majority of our of our business is actually dealing with international oil and gas companies, both foreign and also looking at uh, domestic opportunities. And one of the things that um, we got involved in, that's which uh, is a project I really enjoyed working on, was uh, about seven or eight years ago, a foreign oil and gas or a foreign company, a Japan an Asian Japanese firm who was who was in the construction oil and gas business came to us wanting to know uh, about the oil and gas business and how do we get how do we get into the business because that's where we want to be uh, in the future and uh, we took them down a bit of a non-traditional path in in the sense that traditionally a lot of the asian or especially the japanese companies maybe got involved as a minority predict, uh, position in an uh, exploration block in Kenya or in uh, Libya or maybe in Indonesia where they were um, uh, getting involved in an exploration project, uh, not much input, not much say so, but just really along for the ride. They ended up drilling a dry hole or two and uh, they got turned off on the business and decided to go back to their core activities. And we had seen that pattern, and one of the things that we suggested with them is, really, if you want to know and learn about the oil and gas business as a foreign company, there's no better place to do that than to come into the U.S. with a small uh, operator 
who is very knowledgeable, who knows, who knows their backyard extremely well. And that is a way that you will really learn the business because their desire over the long term was to become an operator. And dealing, being a minority position in a, uh, a mega project is not necessarily a good way to learn the ropes if you want to be in the business in the long term. So we helped them uh, uh, find uh, a partner. They, they bought into uh, a 50% position uh, as a non-operator in a field, uh, in, in a field that had uh, existing production prospects to drill and so forth. And, they, um, and it was with a smaller company where they could actually go in, visit their offices, learn about the business. And after about a year and a half, they bought their partner out where they essentially owned 100% of the field, uh, learned the joys and uh, travails of drilling exploratory wells, development wells, what happens when hurricanes come through and so forth, and um, were really effectively learned the business. And since then, uh, they have um, spread their wings considerably where they have joined in uh, with other large oiling companies operate or taking non-operated positions in the Barnett in the Barnett Shale and in the Eagleford Shale, and so a, as a result, they have transitioned from being uh, uh, somebody who wants to know about the business to a company that operates uh, about 7,000 BOEs a day, uh, has an, an office in Houston, and is investing about, uh, I think, uh, right at $200 million a year into the business. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and one of the things we see is there is an appetite uh, across the, in the industry for repeating that type of experience. But what they really want to know is how to eventually become an operator and work in the business, not just to invest money uh, passively in the in the, in the industry. Good, good. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much. What we'll do here is I'm going to go back to each of the three of them with a question that uh, seems to relate to where they started, and um, we're going to see if there might be some people out there in the audience that would have a question or two after that. So be thinking of those questions, and we want to give you a chance to. To, uh, I know it's awfully comfortable out there, so you might, don't get too comfortable. Start thinking of questions, because we'll come back to you in just a moment. But I, at this point, I wanted to go back to Ken for a second. I hate to keep going in order, but maybe that makes sense. Uh, you brought up crude exports, and I noticed that you know the potential for uh, crude exports more than just the marginal ones that go to certain, you know, that have been approved already. But I noticed the Secretary of Energy yesterday said that the industry just hasn't made the case for crude exports. Um, I get the sense there's an awful lot of work going on trying to make that case. Uh, do you think he just doesn't want to hear it yet, or what? Do you have any thoughts along those lines? I do. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, Secretary Moniz, um, it really doesn't matter what he thinks, to be honest with you, because the crude oil export issue, unlike the LNG export issue, is not in the hands of the DOE. It may sound strange for the so some of the uneducated on this issue, but it's, in the, it's, it's actually in the hands of the Department of Commerce, and this is by active legislation going back 40 years. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's the thing that's really interesting about this, is it's not in the purview of the DOE, and so you know, I'm actually good friends with some people at DOE, and they've commented how happy they are that now that the crude oil export issue is the next hot topic, they're not gonna be called up to Capitol Hill to testify. <laughs> uh, and that's almost odd in a way, right? But. Um, but really what it amounts to is that when you talk about crude oil exports, it, it is a much larger lobbying campaign at its core because it really is to, to see substantive change is going to require an act of legislation. Uh, and so that means there are going to have to be bills drafted that come out of committees in the House and Senate, get to the floor, have all these sort of things attached to them. Believe me, that will happen because you're talking ultimately about energy. Uh, and you'll see a lot of things come and go that never see the light of day, never even make it out of the House or the Senate up to the President. Uh, and then once you get sort of past that point, let's say hypothetically we could get something that everybody could agree on, it got through the House, got through the Senate. Um, I hate to say it, but if it had anything related to Keystone attached to it, it's going to get turned down. 
Um, and that's sort of a really almost ironic kind of thing to say because at the end of the day, going back to the, the first question about energy security, mm -hmm. one of the things that is true about energy security is that increased fungibility or the ability to trade provides the most amount of energy security in any market because ultimately what you're trying to do is be able to trade through arbitrage opportunities that open up. And right now with domestic crude oil, we can't do that. So the, the legislation as it currently exists is actually acting against what its original intent was meant to be. Um, so Secretary Moniz can say all sorts of things, but uh, it really doesn't matter. Uh, because it's We won't tell him you said that, you know, but that's okay. <laughs> his, his opinion matters, yes, but yes. In, in terms of legislation, it's not. Commerce right. and then yeah. legislate the Congress, exactly. the Congress, the active Congress yes. that we had. Yes, yes. Um, very good, <laughs> thanks very much. Uh, John, I just wanted to, push a little bit harder or get you to talk a little bit more, if you would, about the issues that you hear from companies. I hear what you're saying about talent, and that's what I hear over and over again in terms of companies feeling as though they're under a lot of pressure to find the right people to get the jobs done. Um, and you mentioned that some of them trying to think through what they need to do so that they'll be ready 10 years down the road. At have they come to some good conclusions? Yeah, I mean, I think you well, could share with us. Yeah, I, I think that you know, pe people certainly recognize the, the, the issue in the industry. Um, so I think people are starting to, to, to take some some interesting steps. Um, you know, one thing that you know we're we're advocating a lot, and we're seeing our clients starting to do is is to really to apply more advanced analytics to the issue. So kind of step one is understanding where, where do I need to be in you know five ten years in terms of. Uh, my workforce and, and where where does it need to be geographically what skill sets do I need to have so that I can at least take this big undefined problem of I've got a talent gap to what what exactly is the gap where where does it exist and, and you know wh when will it exist um, and, and then you can I think at least put some better solutions around you know recruiting strategies to, to help with that around development strategies I mean wh one thing that, that that I find interesting um, so to Deloitte you know we we do a lot of things. One, one thing that we have to do is we have to manage our own people reasonably well. We have 200,000 um, people globally. So uh, w when you have that large of a workforce and when you only have, when your only assets are people, then you actually spend a lot of time thinking about these issues and particularly around development. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we built a university here outside of Dallas, Deloitte University, mm -hmm. just to try to get ahead of that curve, just to try to actually um, use both to help bring people in to help um, our development programs internally. Um, and so we've actually used that a lot actually with our clients to show them here's the path we've taken. And we're seeing similar concepts being developed at some of particularly our larger clients are developing their own kind of internal universities to develop people. Um, because what that gives you is, the, is, is you have more internal development capability it allows you really to, to go to a broader field of, of, of um, recruits in the future, and take them and bring them up to speed on the important things that you need. So, so I think we're seeing some interesting things there. I guess the other thing I'd mention that I think is interesting in the industry is um, I, I think we're seeing almost different delivery models in terms of how people put talent into the field. Um, some examples of this would be we have clients that are really developing centers of excellence uh, to do, for instance, um, field engineering type work rather than putting all that um, in individual places out in the field, they'll have centers of excellence where they can bring some senior folks um, that have that skill set, but then put a lot of junior people around them to help kind of bring them up the curve, um, but not putting those people kind of out on their own because they found that from a development perspective, they just weren't coming along the way they felt like they could. So, you know, so those kind of things that I think people are starting to really look at in terms of ways to better develop their people going. Okay, forward. very good, thank you. Uh, and towards the end, I want to ask a broader question about Mexico, but let me ask a question of Dee now about something we talked about over lunch a little bit. We talked about shale plays outside of the U.S. I know this is geared more towards Texas and, and so forth, but he talked about, he was sharing some very different numbers and very different regulatory structures in other countries that might make it um, not so likely that we'd have the kind of uh, growth and development as we were having in this country in many of those. Now, don't mean to put you on the spot, but I think <laughs> there were some things that uh, we well, could you could share. Okay. Yes. The uh, you know the conversation was around um, international shale plays, mm -hmm. and and I think there is no doubt that the potential resource um, is there globally within the shale plays. But one of the things that 
uh, oil and gas companies know and, and I know from my past experience of working in an oil and gas company is that costs really matter in these plays. Uh, you have to be the low cost operator. Um, these reservoirs are not very um, prolific per se. Uh, the drainage area is relatively small and there's only so many hydrocarbons that you can effectively uh, put or that are there within sort of the drainage area of, of the well bore. Um, and one of the reasons why the plays have developed in the U.S. is because the level of activity is allowed to be there because the regulations, the Railroad Commission uh, has a process in place where they can process thousands and, and thousands of permits a year, uh, allow operators to continuously um, uh, operate, keep multiple rigs busy in a given play. But there is nowhere else in the world that that occurs. Uh, we were involved with, uh, with a client who was wanting to uh, test uh, an unconventional resource play in uh, Australia. And this is, uh, was about uh, 400 miles north of Perth. They, they drilled the well, but it took them 15 months to get a permit to frack the well. This was a vertical well that they, they drilled through about five different shell intervals and one sort of tight gas end interval. It took them about 15 months to get the permits lined up in place they effectively had to uh, cobble together a frack spread by taking all the pumping pressure equipment that was available within Australia, plus importing pumping pressure equipment from Indonesia. And Halliburton wanted standby time for the entire testing period because there were only two wells that were going to be drilled. So as a result, the testing of this well that, that showed some promise was over $50 million to drill, complete, and test. Um, we've been involved in another uh, play in um, the Northwest Territories of Australia. It, very similar occurrence that just the logistics involved and the, the lack of service company infrastructure drives costs through the ceiling. And that occurs in Europe as well, where um, I've talked to operators and they're not sure how they can get the cost below 20 or $25 million to drill and complete a horizontal type well the way we do it in the U.S. for eight to 10 to $12 million. So as a result, um, that is gonna hinder the development of the plays. As well, the regulatory environment in uh, Poland, for example, they thought they had a major accomplishment when, when ConocoPhillips and a couple of other operators were able to get 15 wells drilled over a three-year period. Um, and, and, and so the, the mindset is not there to allow the levels of activity, and I'm not sure that they have the ability to comprehend. Um, I, I was in uh, London earlier in January where, as some of you may know, there is some um, uh, drilling activity going on in sort of the middle of England and Quadrilla and a couple of other people in Total was uh, involved in the farm out process. In, in the entire country of onshore England, there are two drilling rigs present. I mean, and these plays generally take 20 to 30 to maybe 50 wells before you really know if you have a commercial venture. And that may take 10 years or 15 years in some of these other countries. And so I think the U.S., because of the way we do business in the oil and gas industry, the way it's been uh, certainly a historical um, uh, business within the state of Texas, I think we will maintain our advantage uh, and, and continue to be the, the, the dominant unconventional resource player. And we shouldn't worry soon that, that this is going to be a global phenomenon. I think it may happen eventually, but it, it's not going to uh, take the luster off of the unconventional resource activity in the U.S.
Thank you, Dee. I think those comparisons are very helpful, and so we can't complain quite as much about the regulatory environment here, although some days we certainly want to do it. Let's see if there's someone out there who wants to ask a question. I'm not sure I see a hand. Yes, Excuse me. Sorry. Yes, this might be a little off topic, but you're mentioning uh, the ban on exporting crude. I was wondering about refining capacity. Is that going to be able to be expanded in the next 10 years in any meaningful way? Domestic refining capacity? What was the, the last, I missed that, you mumbled a little bit the last part of your question. Oh, the, refining. Will the d domestic refining capacity be able to be expanded meaningfully? <laughs> well, I, I've actually seen some recent analysis on what the capacity of domestic refining, the, the domestic refining industry is to handle the influx of light crudes. Um, uh, the last data point I saw, which was really referencing some information that was available back in November, uh, was that we're down to about, we can only actually completely displace only about 200,000 barrels a day more of light sweet crudes that we import. So basically we're running into that wall right now. And this pushes then, uh, 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 you know, people to start talking about, well, blending crudes uh, so that you can start thinking about utilizing, you know, moving down the, uh, down the ladder, if you will, in terms of crude quality, but um, you know there are some technical issue, issues associated with, with just blending crudes, first of all, and secondly, it means if you're going to do it, you've got to discount the crudes, uh, and so it's only going to exacerbate the problems that we've already seen that, that exist at Cushing and actually up in you know in the Bakken play in particular related to trying to get that oil away from the region. So um, you saw this actually last November. Um, we, we we smacked up right against that wall when when Louisiana light sweet price discounted heavily, just like. WTI has been against Brent, dropped to about $14, I think, below Brent. So, um, you know, that's going to become more the norm than the exception uh, under current, uh, current law. And so this is going to be the sort of where the rubber hits the road. Um, and there's two, there's two ways to arbitrage through that. One is to allow exports. Uh, the other is to um, actually see investments made at refineries to reconfigure so they can handle more light suites. Um, now, there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem here in terms of the investment logic because it's a classic what we sometimes call investment under uncertainty problem because if you think there's a chance that the regulatory environment might change, you're not going to make investments that post the change would make those investments basically sunk stranded costs. So, um, so refiners are going to be a little bit reticent to you know, engage in these kinds of potentially massive capital endeavors. Uh, knowing that, that really the only thing that's securing the rents in the marketplace right now is, is, is legislation. So it's, uh, I think it's an, it, we're sort of entering into a period where you're going to see at the margin some very small movements in the refining complex, but generally they recognize there are rents associated with what they have, and they recognize that there's a very strong lobby to change the existing paradigm. And so as long as that's the case, then you're not going to see wholesale you know, sweeping change in our refining infrastructure, and you're going to see a continued discount of crude domestically relative to international. Very good question, very important issue. I think we're all going to hear more about that in the next few years, about when we hear about the crude exports. Is there another question out there? Yes. Had kind of a two-part question that has to deal with uh, Mexico and the U.S. and Mexico opening up, uh, potentially opening up to foreign investment. One is I had heard a rumor that Kinder Morgan was building four or five pipelines down into Mexico for natural gas, and uh, wondered what impact that might have on the Mexican economy. And the second impact would be if Mexico was able to open up and allow foreign investment, and that labor force gets geared up down there. Is that going to have any impact on U.S.-Mexico border security? It seems to be a hot button issue every two or four years. Good maybe, questions, tough questions. Maybe something we can all address. I don't know. Yeah. You know uh, I've got a few Does things. Somebody to want to start? Yeah, if one of you guys wants to start first, I can jump yeah, in last. So. That's fine. Well, you know, related to the um, you know opening up of of uh, activity in Mexico, I, certainly I think that's going that's going to happen. Uh, I think. Uh, you know, we, we've seen that. I've actually been down. I was down talking to CNH, one of the, the new regulators, last week uh, in Mexico, helping them understand issues. We heard they haven't seen a JOA. Well, we uh, walked them through, um, 
you know, the, the finer details of a JOA, a farm out agreement, what a host government instrument should look like, how, the, how to evaluate oil and gas uh, exploration prospects and, and assets. Um, you know, I think uh, uh, certainly uh, most of the e &P companies that I have talked to, uh, Mexico is certainly on their radar screen. They are waiting uh, with bated breath for the day that the bid rounds actually uh, occur that allows the uh, uh, international oil companies to go in and invest. And, and we've seen some of the geology this morning of, of how a lot of the plays in South Texas should translate uh, down, in, down into Mexico. And, uh, you know, I think it will be certainly be a positive for the U.S. oil and gas industry. I think it'll certainly be a positive uh, for Texas when that occurs. Um, and, and I think it, it should strengthen the U.S.-Mexico relationship uh, considerably. You know, um, I think with the uh, security issue, I'm not sure I'm necessarily the one to answer uh, that question, but uh, I have been down to Mexico a number of times recently. Um, I, I know the border is fairly, is fairly tenuous, but, but I have talked to some of the landowners that own big ranches just across uh, from Webb County. And um, I think uh, uh, the pathways where the trouble is are fairly focused, and actually most of the, the activity seems to be <coughs> uh, targeted to individuals and, and not necessarily random violence. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll turn the uh, Good night. turn the response. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you, sure. Uh, at, the, at the Baker Institute of Rice, we've actually been doing a lot on this issue, um, and uh, we actually have a, an entire center in the institute that's related to Mexico. And uh, the guy who runs it, Tony Payan, is uh, he's made his name in delving into security issues. So he's probably a much better person to talk about this than I am. But one of the things that I've noticed sort of come to the fore on this is you can uh, distinguish the energy opportunity south of the border between onshore and offshore. And I think it's a very important distinguishing characteristic to make because onshore the security issues are very different than they are offshore obviously. Uh, and onshore uh, I do know and this is just anecdotal but there have been a handful of wells drilled, uh, test wells, trying to evaluate what the shale opportunity is south of the border and I know that uh, I think was Lewis Energy here? I think they were yes, actually. Yes. They were involved in these right and um, uh, I heard a presentation by them that four of the five they actually drilled uh, yielded liquids, which is a promising uh, development. Uh, the trouble is when you actually walk through the logistical nightmare they have to go through to get down there and drill the wells, it's all related to security, right? And so I have talked to other companies that are aware of these sort of, sorts of issues where you'll have your, your manpower at the well site and you only operate, you know, basically during daylight hours. So that's going to limit the amount of time they actually see. Everything shuts down at night because you're basically vacating the site. Or you're keeping everybody stationed there so that there's no migration in and out of the, out, out of the locale. So you know, this is all security related. And when you start talking about companies that are going to move down there and operate in the shale, you know, workforce security is a major issue. Um, and this is, I've heard some people, um, and again, this is only anecdotal, talk about how they won't touch it with a 10-foot pole until the security issues are resolved because effectively what they'd have to do is equivalent to paying someone hazard pay as if they're going to Iraq. Um, and that's a frightening thing to think about, right? But it's the state of play. Whether, you, whether or not it's real is not relevant because perception is reality when it comes to you know, where the investment's going to go. That's why I actually think that offshore is where you're going to see the most activity initially. Um, the onshore opportunity has been shown to be promising, at least with those first initial test wells, but security is a major issue that's going to have to be dealt with. And I think that, that will, to some degree, influence what, what sort of players enter the market. I mean, the, so the, the, the international you know, players, they, the, the majors certainly, you know, they're used to the hostile environments, they're used to that kind of set up in terms of being able to, to work there. And, and I know they're particularly excited about the offshore opportunities. So, you know, I think they, they could be leading the way there. Um, uh, interestingly enough, I was talking to some of our private equity clients about, you know, whether they thought there would be a lot of private equity money um, flowing into the space. And, you know, the, the general reaction I've gotten is there's, there's still too many good opportunities here in the, 
the U.S. And uh, so, you know, I don't see them being first movers, at least in terms of that, from, from what I've seen. I'll, I'll just add one more point to that because um, D raised the point of cost, and um, you know, John raised it too. And when you talk about safety, um, one of the things that's nice about the U.S. is the service industry is very accessible. Right. If you have a problem at a well site, you pick up the phone, you can actually have you know, a pipe string brought to the site immediately and you don't actually have a rig sit idle for a couple of days while you're waiting for that supply chain to sort of be fulfilled. If you're in Mexico and that is, is, is compromised by security concerns, then you're raising the cost of the development for every day that you have to sit idle. And so that's really just going to help delay those issues. So. Well, the Mexico question got asked. Yeah. So I don't have to raise that now. Maybe uh, I've gotten flashed a signal a while back that we are about out of time. And uh, the only thing I would like to say is, I mean, we've talked this whole time and there hasn't been much focus on the price of oil and gas. Um, I guess we're all assuming, maybe this is to all three of you, uh, are we all assuming that it's got to go, both, both oil and natural gas would have to go a lot lower than where they are today, where you foresee them being. Uh, to cut off or significantly limit this new activity. You must make assumptions. <laughs> I mean, the only thing I'd, I'd say is this. Um, you know, $100 oil feels great to, to everybody. That's a, that's a price that, that feels great. It doesn't feel as great if you, if you bought in at, at that level. In other words, when people were buying acreage and under an assumption of, of $50, $60, $70 oil or, or even less in a lot of cases, uh, the economics work really well. There's a lot of companies that got later to the game that, that basically you know, paid an inflated price, uh, and they're really looking at what they've got today and saying, how do we make this work economically, um, even at the relatively strong prices we have today? So, so that's why I think this question of how do we take cost out of the, out of the equation is, is just absolutely critical. It's, and, it, and it's really it's a cost per unit. That's the thing mm -hmm. I focus on. Mm -hmm. So it's about getting, getting better, higher production rates, higher recovery rates, um, and, and getting costs down uh, along the way. So I think that's going to be the big focus. Excellent. Well, I think I don't see the cane, but I think it's getting close. <laughs> so uh, before it, having it happen to us, I'm going to thank these three gentlemen. Very, very good. Very interesting. I appreciate your taking the time. We all do and uh, sharing your expertise with us this afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.